Disc number two. Torah 101, Back to the Basics, the Torah of Yeshua. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. From the Greek text, we get this. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. From the Aramaic, we get this. Do not think that I came to loosen the law or the prophets. I did not come to loosen, but to fill it up completely, meaning to interpret it correctly. In this study, we will look at the standard Greek model and then compare it to the verse in Hebrew and in Aramaic. In Greek, we have Yeshua categorically stating that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. Now, if one really wants to argue a point in English, that the word fulfill in this context means to terminate or bring to a complete end, then it stands to reason that the argument must include not just the law, but also the prophets. In other words, if the Mosaic law is fulfilled and essentially not needed anymore, then also the words of the prophets are fulfilled and essentially not needed anymore. This means that whatever the prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures spoke about, it was all fulfilled. There is no more to look forward to in a culmination of any more of their words because Yeshua satisfied all. If so, then there is this issue of Yeshua's next set of words. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments, and so teaches others, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. As of the writing of this paragraph, we still have a physical heaven and physical earth. Therefore, based on Yeshua's words, the written Torah also must still be with us. But even more so, Yeshua spoke rather forcefully, warning us that anyone who annuls one of the least of Jehovah's eternal commandments, that one will be least in the coming Messianic kingdom. The subject of annulment of the Torah goes back to our opening passage from Devarim Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2, where it says, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of Jehovah your Elohim, which I command you. Nonetheless, I think one of the most astounding statements that Yeshua made in support of the written Torah is in these words. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember I told you that the scribes and Pharisees had instituted a new and improved system for understanding and applying the Torah? Essentially, they succeeded in negating what Moses taught by repairing the content of the written law, so as to retrofit it to their way of thinking through Pharisaic halakha, in the sense that the Torah would now require their expert interpretations and applications. The Pharisees believed in only one authority, themselves. As they believed, only they had enough of a superior learning to interpret the Torah and apply its words. Thus, through their retrofit of sorts, the scribes and Pharisees were able to blow a breath of their fresh air into that old law of Moses. By majority consensus, they simply agreed that it needed to be done, and thus seated themselves into the chair of Moses. Matthew chapter 23 which we will be discussing shortly. And they took authority. By this, you could say that they started whacking away at the Torah of Moses like one takes a sickle and cuts down standing fields of grain. By doing this, the scribes and Pharisees had thus successfully supplanted the written covenant with an oral law, supposedly a unique second revelation given to Moses at the same time that the written law was given. The truth is, the scribes and Pharisees were guilty of decimating and annulling the words of Moses, leading Yeshua to say some very strong words in defense of his position. From Yeshua's perspective, one could only enter the kingdom of heaven if one was more righteous than his rivals. Thus, Matthew 5.17 reads in Greek, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. This being said, let us move on to look at the words in Hebrew and in Aramaic. First, the Hebrew. 
According to a 14th century Hebrew Matthew manuscript referred to as the Evan Bohan, meaning touchstone, from Shem Tov Eben Ben Shiprut, the word hefer is that which brings about the English expression of abolishment. Hefer is found in binyan or verb stem hefil, from the root pe resh resh, which means to break, destroy, or make void. In Bamidbar, Numbers 30, verse 13, we learn this from the Hebrew word pe resh resh. Every vow and every binding oath to humble herself, her husband may confirm it or her husband may annul it. The written Torah allows a husband or a father to declare his wife's or his daughter's vow to be invalid. In other words, hefer means invalidation. In contrast, the Hebrew word for fulfill in Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is from lehashlim, which means to validate or complete something, but not in the sense of a permanent release from duty. The Peshitta uses lamale, which means to fill up full. Whether lahashlim in the Hebrew Matthew or lamale in the Peshitta, the essence of Yeshua's teaching is reflected in Romans 3.31. Paul said, Do we then nullify the law through faith? Meaning, do we then cancel the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. In the Peshitta, it says, on the contrary, we make certain the law. Again, bring this back around full circle to Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. The idea of Matthew 5.17 is to have a right interpretation of a biblical verse. If a passage of the Torah were wrongly interpreted, it would destroy the Torah, whereas if one succeeded in preserving the original intent of a verse, it established or fulfilled it. The Peshitta for Matthew 5.17 uses Eshreya from Shin Reish He, which means to untie or loosen and amaleia, which means to complete or fill up full. Now watch how this word is used in another place of the Peshitta from John, Yochanan 19.10. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? He uses the word de'ashrich. Here in de'ashrich, he uses the root from shin resh he meaning to untie or loosen. Besides use in normal day-to-day -day life, Eshreya also had legal ramifications in the context of properly interpreting the Torah. Thus, Yeshua said to Peter, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Here Yeshua contrasts two words, detasor, meaning to forbid, and asir, forbidden. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here Yeshua contrasts the two words, Ditishreya and Shreya. This was the basis of Yeshua's teaching about binding and loosing, which is about handing down a proper interpretation of the written commandments, something that the scribes and Pharisees did not do. Hence, referring to Matthew 5.17, Yeshua was saying that he did not intend to make void even a tag of the Torah. Instead, he was unequivocally saying, Do not think that I came to loosen the law or the prophets. I did not come to loosen but to provide a proper interpretation of them. What is a tag in Hebrew? It is the Greek term tittle, and it refers to a crownlet that decorates seven letters of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Interestingly, for a little tangent, these crowns are referred to in mystical Judaism as tongues of fire. He did not come to unravel the Torah. He came to set it on a firm foundation without changes, as the scribes and Pharisees were endlessly doing. Confidently, I think that the scribes and Pharisees who heard Yeshua teaching on the subject were forced in their own minds to face their crimes, that of adding to the law. Remember what was later recorded in the Perkei Avot, Sayings of the Fathers, chapter 1, Mishnah 1. Make a fence around the Torah. But did Yehovah say this? No. Yehovah said, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. In other words, don't fence it in. Yochanan 7, 14 through 19. 
page 22. But when it was now in the midst of the feast, referring to Sukkot, Yeshua went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews, therefore, were marveling, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? Yeshua, therefore, answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of Elohim or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Here you can sense a measure of dripping Pharisaic arrogance as it is unleashed against Yeshua. The scribes and Pharisees who were proudly trained in the traditions of their fathers, Hallel and Shammai, accused Yeshua of not having real learning in the Torah, because in the mind of his accusers, real learning was acquired only when it was accompanied by mastering the mitzvot or the commandments that came through education in their oral tradition. This appears to be the obvious meaning, because Yeshua's opponents used two unique words for their sarcasm learning, and education. Learning intimates learning from the written Torah, because in the Aramaic Peshitta of John 7.15, learning is the Hebrew word sefer, which refers to a book or scroll of the Torah. But then they went on to say that Yeshua lacked in education, suggesting that he did not really have true knowledge of the Torah or true knowledge of the book, because they knew him to be opposed to their teaching of the oral traditions. In contrast, the word education in our passage is lamad, which appears in the verb stem binyan pa'al, which carries with it the sense of learning through arguments and pleadings. Here is Talmudic tractate Makot 10a on education in the disciplines of rabbinic oral law. Quote, I was educated much from my teachers, more from my colleagues, and most from my pupils. One who went beyond learning in the written commandments of Jehovah was called educated, as the scribes and Pharisees considered themselves. They knew how to manipulate the written word in such a way that they could present excellent arguments and pleadings by applying certain hermeneutic rules of interpretation, according to the tradition of the elders. You can see a primary example of this kind of thinking in another passage recording Yeshua's words, that of Luke 10, 25-29. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love Jehovah your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Yeshua, And who is my neighbor? The Torah used the word neighbor, borrowed from Leviticus nineteen seventeen through 18 but the lawyer, the scribe, wanted to justify whether this Torah command applied to him. So he challenged Yeshua to come up with a legal definition for the term neighbor. So Yeshua told the story of the Good Samaritan. In the confrontation of Yochanan seven fourteen through nineteen, quote, how has this man become learned, meaning possessing knowledge of the commandments, having never been educated, meaning having no acceptance of the oral law? Yeshua was responding to his challengers by telling them that he, Yeshua, knew that they were guilty of what is called eisegesis reading meanings into the written commandments, but that they, the scribes and Pharisees, in reality had no real learning of the Torah. All they had was an empty education in the tradition of the elders. Hence, Yeshua's words, Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Yochanan 18, 33-38, page 23. Here Yeshua was standing in the judgment hall of the praetorium of Pilatus, or Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. Pilatus was questioning Yeshua because his accusers were not allowed to judge capital cases. The Romans had taken this authority away from the Jews at some point prior to this event. Here is the narrative. Pilate therefore entered again into the praetorium and summoned Yeshua and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yeshua answered, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, 
I am not a Yehudi, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests, referring to Annas and Caiaphas and all the previous high priests who were alive at the time, delivered you up to me. What have you done? Yeshua answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Yehudim. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate therefore said to him, So you are a king. Yeshua answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Again, ask this question, what is truth to 10 people from all different walks of life? And you will probably get 10 different opinions. However, in answering Pilate's words, what is truth? All one has to do is read the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. In Psalm 119, verses 142, 151, and 160, we have these three statements of fact concerning the written law. Verse 142, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. The word there is Torah. Verse 151. Thou art near, Jehovah, and all thy commandments are truth. Verse 160. The sum of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances is everlasting. Thus, Yeshua confirms these ideas in Yohanan 17.17. 17. Sanctify them in the truth Thy word is truth. Matt Yahu or Matthew 26, 63 through 64, page 24. But Yeshua kept silent, and the Kohen Gadol said to him, I adjure you by the living Elohim that you tell us whether you are Hamashiach, the son of Elohim. Yeshua said to him, You've said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. These words of Yeshua, in response to a questioning from the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, contain two explicit references to the Messiah imagery of David, Daniel, and Moses in the Torah. First from David, Yehovah has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a Kohen forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Adonai is at thy right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Psalm 110, verses 4 through 5. Please note that in a rabbinic prayer book for the holy days of Shavuot or Pentecost, the name Adonai, Aleph, Dalid, Nun, Yud, is said to be a temple for the dwelling of the holy name yud He vav He. This is from Masora Publications, Art Scroll Machzor for Shavuot, First Edition, First Impression, May 1991, page 440. Here is something from Daniel 7.9. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. It 